Pointing up in the Old Testament, in the, in the books of Samuel, but I want to start in the New Testament before I get there. I'm reminded as I get older, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. Uh, I have told you for years that we are dirt bags. We are created from dirt. When I laid hands on that coffin, a 59-year-old man who passed away on Friday, I told their family, seven children, ashes to ashes and dust to dust. From this earth we came, from this earth we return. That's where our bodies, these earth suits go. So when I read the scripture, we have this treasure in jars. That treasure is Christ in you, the hope of glory. You are not perfect. You are not whole. And probably, no matter your age, you're probably not mature. We're going to get that when we get to heaven. But on this earth, we struggle and fight with disabilities. I believe, honestly, the older I, I've gotten, we used to think disabilities was somebody in a wheelchair. Actually, everybody I've met has some form of disability. You may not see it, but it's there. There's something that's causing you to, uh, this is a good time to go to the title, Cheryl. There it is. <laughs> I saw this on a t-shirt many, many years ago at camp when we had six years of uh, camp blessing, which we dealt with children who had disabilities. Joseph, it changed my life. I'm a man who was raised with a sister who had disabilities who died in a wheelchair. I, myself, and my family have been fighting with certain disabilities, and then I meet people that have them. But to see those words, need not disqualify. I watched a man who had one leg play golf. One leg. You said H? Blew my mind. I watched, I played golf with a man who had one arm, and he beat me with one arm. I've seen a woman with no arms shoot a bow and arrow. Blew my mind. Disabilities need not disqualify. What I'm saying is, you've got to get to a place in this life where you quit complaining about what little tick you got. What little thing you keep blaming life on and realize that the grace of God is strong enough for you it's strong enough for all of us to get through it. Grace is here. I, we're not going to get grace in heaven. You're not going to need grace in heaven. There you'll be mature. You won't have a handicap. You won't have a disability. When you play golf, they give you a handicap, don't they, H? Right. Amen. I don't have a handicap in golf. That's how bad I am. <laughs> Father, I thank you for your word. Let it penetrate our hearts, minds. Let us walk out of here different. We thank you for the tears that were shed this morning. They're tears of love and appreciation for a couple. In Jesus' name, amen. Many thoughts on grace. Somebody sees a ballet dancer and they say, that's graceful. When I see a ballet dancer, I think that looks painful. <laughs> we say grace at meals. Somebody say, say grace. No, no, I'm just saying. We, we, y'all are so good. Y'all are so sweet. Uh, say, say grace at, at meals. We do. We, we say it. And by saying it, what we're saying is, I'm hoping whatever's been prepared is not going to hurt me. Amen. It's that kind of. I don't think when we get, have the Lord's Supper, we're going to say uh, grace. Uh, we're just going to enjoy. Uh, and so it brings such grace. So-and-so brings such grace to the event. Uh, one of the, our most favorite songs of the gospel that we've heard uh, by John Newton, Amazing Grace. Ephesians 2.8 tells us, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It's a gift of God. Yeah. Amen. i got to remind myself I'm saved by faith. It doesn't matter how I feel. 
doesn't matter what comes over me or, or what reactions I may have to life. I, I am saved by grace. Everybody say grace again. Grace such a powerful force that God gives us. Amen. Not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. Not by works so that no one can boast. The word grace, if I define it, is unmerited favor. Hmm. Extending special favor to someone who doesn't deserve it. Who hasn't deserved it. Who hasn't earned it. And can never repay it. Amen. As a parent, do you realize how much grace you give your children? Look at your, th I'm thinking right now, thinking out loud. Look how much you do for your kids who didn't deserve it, hasn't deserved it, hasn't earned it, and can never repay it. Are you realizing that your kids can never pay you back? Are you realizing you can never pay your parents back? Come on. That's grace. You don't get mad at grace. You thank God for grace. Every child ought to thank God for grace. Every adult ought to thank God for grace. Grace is such a powerful thing. Amen. So when I think about it, it's undeserved, unearned, and, uh, and you can't even repay it. That's where I'm at. That's why this song, this, this gratitude song means so much when I hear it. It's just one more hallelujah. I just want to give God thanks for that. So I, I got to stay with the stories that I've been sharing over the last few weeks. Pastor Joseph touched on it when he talked about, and, and listen to me, we, we've talked about King David. We talked about how he was anointed by a Samuel, a prophet. Then, then the Hannah had Samuel, wasn't supposed to have a child, but, but she got a word she was going to have a child. And then Hannah has this boy Samuel, and then Samuel grows up to be a prophet, anoints David as a king. Then we got King Saul, who's the first king of Israel. He's head and shoulders taller than everybody else. Saul has a son. His name is Jonathan. He's a, he's a good looking, and he's bold as a lion. Amen. He's an amazing young man when you read about it. And he connects with David. There's certain people in your life you connect with, they make your baby jump. They, you get excited excited when you're around them. They're, they're the ones you hang out with in school. They're, they're the ones you just, you make those connections. And David and Jonathan loved one another. The problem was is that Saul was jealous of David, the, the giant killer, and he tried to kill David. Amen. And he run David off, and David went and hid in a, ca a cave. I'm going to give you a great stories here. And when he got in the cave, he hid there. 400 men found him who were in debt, disillusioned, and discouraged. They, they had 3D vision, I call it, distorted. When they got there, David turned them into his mighty men, such as Benaiah and Abishag, and these great guys that did extremely exploits. And David became a raider against the Philistines. And he actually feigned madness at one time and went and lived in a place called Gath. Gath. Gath is the name of a place, Goliath of Gath. And he actually had Goliath's sword with him. So it gave him street cred. Okay, and then he would go out and raid against the Philistines without the Philistines even know he was doing it. They thought he was against Israel. During this time, Saul goes to war and Saul gets killed. Saul actually takes his own life in a chariot for fear they were going to take him and uh, parade his body around. His son Jonathan, whom David had covenant with, died. It's, it's a story, as, and even in the midst of all this story, David had time to get with a young lady named Bathsheba whose husband was a mighty warrior named Uriah. And she gets pregnant, and David tries to cover it up. And in the cover-up, Uriah gets uh, killed by a stone thrown over as they push toward a castle, if you would, a wall. A stone comes over and kills him. A prophet by the name of Nathan shows up and points a finger at David and says, Thou art the man. You messed up. David repented. Before God wrote Psalm 51, creating me a clean heart, O oh God. Renew a right spirit within me. You can read it for yourself. As he walks through this time, because he's a man after God's own heart, and he screwed up. And yet we see God love him because David loved God. David never had a physical miracle in his life. Not one time did you see David part water or, or turn it to wine or, or, or turn bread a stone in the bread. You don't see any. You don't see the raising of the dead with David. You just see a mighty man. Hmm. So we get him into a place in life where him and Jonathan are connected in First Samuel chapter twenty. And when they get together, this is what the scripture says: 
Then Jonathan said to David, By the Lord, the God of Israel, I will surely sound out my father, know his intentions. I want, to know, I want you to know his intentions. I believe my dad wants to kill you. By this time, the day after tomorrow, if he is favorably disposed toward you, will I not send you word and let you know? But if my father is inclined to harm you, may the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely. If I do not let you know and send you away safely, may the Lord be with you as he has been with my father. Verse 14, so important. But show me unfailing kindness like that of the Lord as long as I live so that I may not be killed. This is important. Unfailing kindness is what we do for one another. The grace of God is vertical. But the grace of God is also horizontal. When we show one another grace, when we say, I see your handicap, I see your disability, I see the place you are in life, uh, Pastor Joseph, I, I mentioned that there was a young man while I was preaching that funeral that looked like he was going to bite my head off. I realized that after the, I didn't tell you this, after the funeral, his disabilities, he could barely walk and he could barely talk and everybody looked after him. I misjudged him. Do you know how many times we misjudge people by the appearance? You ought to be up here where I'm at. <laughs> okay, back to the word here. Verse 15, and do not ever cut off your grace, kindness from my family. Not even when the Lord has cut off every one of David's enemies from the face of the earth. So Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, saying, may the Lord God call David's enemies to account. And Jonathan had David reaffirm his oath out of love for him because he loved him as he loved himself. Powerful word here. So these guys make covenant with one another. A covenant is, is a promise. It's an oath. I'm going to take care of you. I promised I was going to do that. You've got to be careful with it because you may, in a time of emotion, make an oath or a promise to somebody you can't keep. So out of grace, he says to David, I know that God has anointed you to be the king. I know that my daddy is a mess up. I know that eventually you're going to be the king. And when it happens, show kindness toward me. Do something for me. So here we understand it was a custom in Eastern dynasties that when a new king took over, all the family members of the previous dynasty were exterminated so there could be no revolt. We see that in all kinds of movies. Amen. You just wiped out, no matter if they're babies, you get rid of them. First uh, Samuel chapter 4, verse 4 tells us Jonathan son of Saul had a son who was lame in both feet. He was five years old when the news about Saul and Jonathan came from Jezreel. What was the news? That Saul had died and Jonathan is dead. If Jonathan is dead then we got to get this boy out of here because they're going to kill him because he's in the lineage or the line to become the next king. So the nurse picked him up and fled but as she hurried to leave now she's holding a five year old You'd think that she'd hold his hand and let him run. But instead, she picked him up, took off running. He, th then she fell. Uh, he fell and became crippled. His name was Mephibosheth. So he's the son of Jonathan. And they hid him away so nobody would know about it. David, after years of peace, is now the king. He's reflecting, like we are today, about people who have uh, uh, fought in war, died, and he's reflecting back on Jonathan and Saul. And he's thinking about his friend. And this is, this is my life, and I pray it's your life. That you've got friends and people that you know who are either in the military or in the spiritual fights in this life. And you review and you look back and you remember them. You know, after 30-something years of pastoring now, I look back and I remember so many people that I have done funerals for. So many people that have been part of my life. They're gone now. And, it, and it, it becomes emotional. And David begins to reflect back. And he, he looks back. And, and he starts thinking about that promise of grace, of kindness, that unconditional acceptance in spite of the other person. They didn't deserve it. They didn't earn it. They, didn't, they can't repay it. In 2 Samuel chapter 9, verse 1, David asked this question. Is there anyone still left of the house? He didn't have to ask the question, but he did. Is there anyone Anyone still left of the house of Saul of whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? I remember my brother. I remember the covenant I made. I remember him. Is there anyone? Everybody say, is there anyone? See, I believe there's anyone all over this place. There are people that they need. They may not deserve it, but they need the grace of God. 
Amen. They need help in so many ways. Again, it didn't ask, is there anyone that's qualified? Is there anyone out there that's worthy? Is there anyone out there that's got enough money that I can be graceful to? No, uh, is there anyone? Amen. And the question was answered in verse 3. Yes, there is a son of Jonathan, but in his name is Mephibosheth. Now, now Mephibosheth's name literally means uh, scattered shame, uh, a lappy stock. I remember in high school, after I got injured playing football, I had a cast on my foot. And, uh, and, and it, you know, don't you love high school? I love high school. I just love high school. I loved high school. Man, I loved. And I had this cast on my foot. And, and, and all, all the women, all the, we didn't have no women in high school. We had girls. Uh, all the girls signed my cast. Oh, and it meant so much to me. And I used it. Oh, did I use it, you know? And I had them sign it. I had a wildcat on the side, Carver Heights Wildcats. You know, I had that wildcat painted and, and had all this stuff. It was so good, you know, through school. And then they, they took the cast off, and, uh, and I was wearing a pair of chucks. Y'all know what chucks are? Some uh, Converse high tops. And I was walking with some friends of mine toward an uh, auto store. And if you had hot rods, you visited auto stores quite often. And I'm walking toward the auto store. And as I'm walking toward the auto store with my friends, I noticed something for the first time. I walked different than they did. My foot was rolled over. I was walking on the side of it. And I had a pronounced limp. And I thought, well, surely it's going to get better. And it only got worse. And as I'm walking... It hit me how different I am from them. And then my disabilities began to show, and it began to affect me emotionally. And then they took me down to Birmingham, and they broke my foot, and they fused it. And I was in the hospital with a young black man, a young, black, young, young man. And we were friends, and we talked, and he talked about his surgeries, and I talked about mine. And the next morning... When I woke up, they put me to sleep in order to break the bones and fuse my foot. I woke up, and I looked over, and his bed was empty. And I asked the nurse, where did my friend go? He died in the night. Here I was, 14, 15 years old, and I'm watching all these things start. That's why hospitals are important to me. When I can get there, I get there um, to see people because I know what that stress feels like. But disabilities begin to affect your life, and, and, and they start working on you. And here, this Mephibosheth, his name means shame. He's, he's a grown man now, but he can't walk. He's disabled. He has this thing on him. And, and again, let me tell you, grace is not picky. The question David asked was, where is he? Not how bad is he, or how did this happen? Just where is he? It's one-sided. When you extend grace to somebody, you don't say, well, look, if you meet this demand, this demand, this demand, I'll, I'll, I'll give you grace. No, it's one-sided. I'm going to be, I'm going to be, gra you've talked about me. You've ran me down. You've laughed about me. You, and I'm going to tell you something, you owe me money, but I'm going to wipe it all clean and tell you, I love you. I release. That's what he did. That's what he did for us over and over. The Scripture says he was five years old when it happened. Did you know that five actually is the number of grace? There were five loaves of bread. There were five wounds in the body of Christ. Amen. There, there was uh, there, the fivefold ministry, the, 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 the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, the teacher. Fivefold ministry is grace. So it looked like judgment, but later it was going to become grace. Our lives uh, are quite like a rowboat, aren't they? We go forward backwards. We're always going forward backwards. Uh, we're moving, but we don't realize where we're going. We're always going somewhere, but we don't realize it until we get there. Uh, this is kind of funny, D, but oftentimes when we're hunting for a golf ball, we go past it to look back to see it. You know why? Because we always thought we hit further than what we hit. <laughs> <laughs> is that right, Jerome? Come on. Amen. 2 Samuel chapter 9, to question again, is there anyone? Yeah, but he's disabled. The king asked, is there no one still left of the house of Saul to whom I can show grace to? Ziba answered the king, there is still a son of Jonathan. He's crippled in both feet. 
Where is he? The king asked. And he said, well, he said, make car. He's in a place called Lodabar. The word Lodabar simply means a place of unimaginable drought, uh, dryness, desolation, no rain, little life. You know, if God's grace is ever going to touch your life, it's going to be in a place of dryness. It's going to be a place of barrenness. It's going to be in a place where you hurt the most. That's why I need the grace of God. Can I get an amen? Amen. And again, he's disabled. Uh, listen, that boy had to think to himself and reflect back. I was a king's kid. My daddy, Jonathan, was going to be the king. My grandpa was the king. I have lands. I had a palace. I had people looking after me. And now I'm in this dry, barren, desolate place in my life. Disabilities can change your life overnight. Just like that. Just like that. I was with my friend, Pastor Rick Hawkins, Wednesday at MD Anderson. You know that they've, uh, they, they said there's no more cancer in his blood, but that leukemia keeps trying to come back. And he's going to be on a, a process of uh, chemotherapy for months now as he goes back to Oklahoma City. That's, that's the only thing. They couldn't give him. A, and I thought to myself, dear God, this man was roping cattle he was winning money he was pastoring a great church he was preaching at other great facilities and and in one day he became disabled and i looked in his eyes on wednesday and i wept and i thought that could be me just like this one accident one disease one loss of a limb disabled the mind starts playing tricks on you Disabled. All of us have some type of disability. Everybody. I've never met anybody that didn't have one. Hmm. Let me hang out with you. That's why some of y'all won't talk to me. Because you don't want me to know. But it's okay. I share mine. You can share yours. We all have them. How about his emotional disability? You say, yeah, you look good. You're healthy, strong. <laughs> Emotional. I mean, guys that are statured. Physically, God has endowed them with muscle and strength. I met a guy on the golf course the other day. Just mouthy. Language was bad. And, it, and he said something I, I will not repeat. But when he said it, it had something to do with church. And uh, something about, it's so hot in here, something about church. I'll just leave it like that. And, uh, and I looked at him, and I said, that's funny, you should say that. <laughs> I just came from church, from a man who just died at 59 years of age on a motorcycle. And I'm going to tell you something. Yeah, it gets hot in church. But, but as soon as I said it, his whole countenance changed. All of a sudden, damn became darn. I don't know if you've ever seen anybody get born again that fast, but it happened. <laughs> <laughs> and I carry them, I carry them, and now I carry them little chips and little coins with me. And I gave him and his buddy, oh, you're my kind of pastor. You're, and the more we talked to him, the more excited he got about church and stuff. And I looked at him and I thought, he's a good looking, tall son buck, but he is disabled. His mind is crippled. He needs Jesus. Amen. And just to have that time with them, to connect with them, I felt it was a God moment for it. 2 Samuel 9, verse 8. Mephibosheth bowed down and said, What is your, this is when he met David, what is your servant that you should notice a dead dog like me? To look at yourself and beat yourself up. To consider your, it's, listen, it's one thing to be a dog, but it's another thing to be a dead dog. Amen good for nothing, rotten, food for buzzards. And that's how he saw himself. I'm just a dead dog. I'm dragging these feet around with me. See, today we've got disability acts. We've got to have bigger doors and wider halls. And, and we've got to have ramps and doors that open. And they didn't have that then. 
If you, were, if you had a disability, you begged. You had to have somebody take care of you. And even though he's Jonathan's son, amen, he's living in Lodabar in a dry place, he's, I, I, I can see he's tattered, his clothes are tattered, he's messed, uh, he's, uh, maybe, maybe he has crutches, maybe he has some chair, I don't know. Is he dragging his stumps around? I don't know what he's doing. But a disability, amen, no, nonetheless, and then here's the word, the king wants to see you. His whole life he's been told, if you ever get found out, if any, and very few people know about you, but Zeba knew you. They're going to kill you, son, if they ever find out. And the word, as they knock on the door, who is it? I'm the king's escort. We're looking for Mephibosheth. He's not here. We know he lives here. He lives here at, at Lodabar, Peach Street, 22152. We know he's here. There's no one here by that name. Then the doors open. Mephibosheth comes out. They pick him up. They put him in a carriage, a chariot, or or threw him on the back side of a donkey, and they had him off to the palace. Fearing death, Mephibosheth throws himself prostrate before the king. It wasn't a long fall. He was almost there anyway. Verse 6, 2 Samuel 9, When Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David, he bowed down to, him, to pay him honor and said, Mephibosheth, your servant, he replied. You, Mephibosheth, that's who you are? Yeah, it's true. It's me. Waiting for the pulling of a sword from his holder to strike his neck, he heard these unbelievable words. Cha-ching. Bingo. Touchdown. Home run. Go. Don't be afraid, David said to him, for I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I will restore to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather, Saul, and you will always eat at my table. Cha-ching. Bingo. How many's ever shouted those words? Touchdown, home run, goal, amen. I mean, it's, it's like everything you ever imagined. You, my friend, you, I'm going to give you lands. What? We're going to take care of you. What? You're going to eat at my table. What? Amen. Picture the dinner bell rings, and here comes David's family. The dinner guests, the smell of roasted lamb with lentils. Here comes Amnon, the clever, witty one, gets to the table first. Joab, David's commander, muscular, attractive, skin brown from the sun, walking tall, lays his armor down. Experienced soldier takes his seat. Then stopping to glance at himself in the mirror is Absalom. The beautiful one with long flowing hair took after his father, David. But then you hear the awkward clump, clump, clump. And here comes the newest member of David's clan, adopted by grace. Didn't earn it, didn't deserve it, could never repay it. Amen. Takes his place as one of the king's sons at the table slides his useless legs under the cloth, and there he sat at the same level of everybody at the table. Do you know what grace does? It brings us all at the same level. No big eyes, no little use. We all get into heaven, and you're going to leave this place the same way you came in. The breath of God brought you here. The breath of God is going to take you out of here. Amen. 2 Samuel 9, 11. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table. Josiah, one more time. Just Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. Someday, we too will go eat at the table 
as a king's son and daughter. He is king of kings, Lord of lords. When I see Jesus, when he met handicapped, really physically disabled people, a man was laying by the pool called Beth, Bethesda, Bethsaida, something like that. A pool called Beth. And as he laid there, he made us, he'd been there for, I'm trying to remember the story now, it seemed like 40 years, long time, his whole life. And his excuse was, there's nobody to put me in the water when it stirs. And somehow the stirring of the water felt like a miracle. And Jesus looked at him. Jesus never said to the man, your faith made you whole. He just told him, get up and walk. No more excuses. It's grace. Would you stand with me? It's grace. He healed him. And when I walk through Scripture, I see it over and over, him healing people with disabilities. A man broke chains full of the devil. A lunatic. Jesus drove the pigs, I mean, excuse me, the, the devils out of his life into the pigs. And the pigs went over a cliff. It's a tremendous story. It's the first place a swine flew. I'm sorry, devil him. And the scripture says he was sitting there in his right mind. A woman sitting by the well, been married five times. And the man she was shacked up with was not her husband. You don't think she's handicapped? She's handicapped. She's disabled. She can't. Her picker's broke. You ever see anybody? Never mind, don't look at me. But their picker's broke. Jesus put a face on grace. He showed me what grace looked like. See, in the Old Testament, well, all we saw was God being judgmental. God's always judging, always judging. Jesus, and God said, nah, that ain't who I am. So he wrapped himself in flesh and said, let me show you who I really am. I'm a father to the fatherless. I set lonely people in families. I create churches so people can gather, be loved, and care, and feel the grace of God. That's what I do. Listen, we had nothing, deserved nothing, could repay nothing. In fact, we didn't even try. This is my, this is the thing that blows my mind. We didn't even try. We didn't even try to win the king's favor. That's what you know what worship is for me? It's trying, it's winning the king's favor. I want you to know God. I want to win your favor. I can't even do it, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you I love you. And the tears I shed. It's more than because I love this couple. I love you. And I thank you for sending them here. And I, I pray next week I shed tears again. I love you. We were hiding from the king. We were hiding when he found us. We were doing our own thing. And he found us. He sought us. Pursued us. How can you not love a king like that? How can you not appreciate him? How can you know? We were involved in a futile life from one guilt experience to another. We had nothing to offer him, not one good work that we could say genuinely revealed righteousness. And yet the king set his heart toward us, grace. He said, you're mine. I take you just as you are. I want you, I want your crutches. I want your hang-ups, your liabilities. You're just damaged goods. I don't change your life. Bow your head just for a moment. Get your head right. Get your head right. It was the grace of God that saved you. It was the grace of God that turned you around. It's the grace of God. Come on, just slip your hands toward me. Just a second. Can you pull that mic to you? Could you turn that mic on? Could you sing a little of that song for me?
God some praise in you. Would you do that right now? Stand here, face me, please. Guys, if y'all come here, if I get some of you guys come behind him, mm. you're welcome to come up. Many of you are. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Mm. <laughs> well, thank God it ain't the last time. It's not your funeral. Thank you, Jesus. Father, in Jesus' name, we take away and rebuke all anxiety of this trip. And we send them forth in power and might of the Holy Spirit. We ask, God, you lead and guide them and that angels would protect them. That, God, you dispatch even new angels from heaven that have not been around them before and let them just absolutely admire their love for each other and their love for you. Yes. We thank you, Lord, for doors that are going to be open for them. And it won't just be these first doors. It, there's going to be new doors in the future. We thank you, Lord, for opportunities to come back to this house. And, yes. and even when they're here to understand that, God, they, they, they're still just as part as when they left. Yes. God, I thank you for your goodness that you financially support them, look after them, and God, keep their health right. God, I thank you that every filling in their mouth will stay good and their teeth will stay right. And, and God, their minds will be together and, and Lord, there'll be an understanding. Yes. Keep, the, keep that forward running and help them get rid of that farfanugan. Lord, we thank you for all your goodness in their life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, 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 amen. amen, amen, amen. Amen. When you have two churches, you got to do this twice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Amen. Before you sit down, grab an offering envelope. <laughs> grab an offering envelope. If you'd like to give online, you can go to holywild.net slash give. I want you to think about honoring the king today and understand that grace. When you give your tithe, you're not paying God. You're not paying God. You, 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 you release it from yourself. You're giving back to him that which he's blessed you with. You never pay tithe. You never pay offerings. Amen. We give back to the king. We thank him for it. And for over 40 years of serving God, I, you know, it was King David that said, I've never seen the righteous forsaken. I've never seen his seed begging bread. I never want to see my seed, though I have no biological seed, I have a lot of spiritual seed of people that have been connected in my life, and I pray that I never see them begging bread. You know, I just want to see God bless them too. Amen? Amen. You got your offering there? Everybody ready? As we give today, we're believing God for? More money, less hours, benefits, sales and commission, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, bills paid off, settlements, inheritance, rebates and returns, debts demolished, royalties received, favor, success to the kingdom. Pastor Joseph. Hallelujah. Really just have one announcement this week. Uh, this Tuesday, at our North Campus, we are having a um, 